Good evening and welcome. I am Digbir Jais, Vice President of Research and International at the University of Manitoba. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba is on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Welcome to this evening's topic for discussion, math and mental health in Manitoba. Tonight's panel is made up of University of Manitoba expertise in this field of research. Under the guidance of your moderator, this evening team will share their knowledge on the latest findings about factors contributing to the rise in math uh, use in Manitoba. I encourage you to participate in the conversation with you, our experts and ask probing questions. At this time, I want to introduce your moderator for this evening, Dr. Mariette Chartier. Dr. Chartier is a senior research scientist at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Her main research interests are in the area of child and adolescent health, population mental health, and intervention research. She was the co-principal investigator on the methamphetamine use in Manitoba report. She recently led provincial reports on the mental health of children in Manitoba, mental illness among adult Manitobans, and the health and well-being of First Nations children. Dr. Chartier will introduce our panel for tonight and outline the process for the conversation. Thank you, Megwitch, merci. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jayas. Uh, good evening, everyone. Bon soirée à tous. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, to this uh, cafe, scientifique, entitled Math and Mental Health in Manitoba. So um, I'll just give a, a quick overview of how we plan to proceed on our online Café Scientifique. Um, so each of our panelists will speak briefly uh, on their perspectives based on their expertise on tonight's topic. And then I'll open things up for questions. So questions can be posed via Slido. And I believe that slide will come up uh, when it is time. Oh, there we go, it's at the bottom. And um, so this, there, there's a link in the YouTube description in this feed you're watching and also on the screen throughout the discussion. So you don't need to download uh, any software for this application, just um, an internet browser and the discussion code. Uh, I'll be moderating questions from Slido uh, as well as the interactions with our panelists tonight. So now uh, I have the great pleasure of uh, presenting our distinguished panelists. They are Dr. Nathan Nickel, Dr. Christine Leong, uh, James, and Dr. James Bolton. Here we go. There we have our panelists. So um, Dr. Nathan Nickel is an Associate Professor of Community Health Sciences and Associate Director at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy at Max Rady College of Medicine. Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. He's an applied population health scientist who uses big data to conduct health and social policy research. His research centers on examining how social and structural determinants impact population health and well-being. He has conducted evaluation research looking at programs aimed at improving child outcomes. He has led mental health and addictions research examining outcomes associated with alcohol use disorders, methamphetamine, and opioid use, and outcomes associated with interactions with provincial systems such as the justice and child welfare systems. Much of his research is done on partner in partnership with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit organizations in Manitoba. And in 2019, Dr. Nickel was inducted into the U.S. National Honor Society for Public Health 
for Excellence in Research and Service in Population Health. So welcome, uh, Nathan. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Leong. She's an assistant professor at the College of Pharmacy, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. She also has a cross appointment with the Department of Psychiatry, Max Rady College of Medicine. She practiced as a, she practiced as a clinical pharmacist in an interprofessional teaching family medicine clinic. Her primary area of research is in primary care, pharmacy practice and education, and psychotropic medication using, um, use, using methods in pharmacoepidemiology and mixed methods research. She's a member of the Canadian Research Initiative in Substance Misuse. There, she received grant support to link data from the Addictions Foundations of Manitoba to the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy to study long-term outcomes of substance use in Manitoba. Dr. Leong is also a member of the Adult Inquest Review Committee at the Medical Examiner's Office of Manitoba, where she meets monthly to review cases of overdose deaths in Manitoba. Welcome, Christine. And um, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Bolton. He is the Ruth Hurd Professor in Psychiatry at the Max Rady College of Medicine, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. He is um, the Director of Research in the Department of Psychiatry. His research interests are in mental health and addictions, suicide and bereavement. Dr. Bolton's clinical work is in emergency psychiatry. He is the Medical Director of Shared Health Manitoba Crisis Response Services, as well as the Health Sciences Emergency Psychiatry Program. Welcome. So now um, I'd like to call on, doc, uh, on Nathan to make his remarks. Thank you so much, Mariette. Um, so as Mariette mentioned, uh, we did a study looking at methamphetamine use in the province. Um, and largely that was uh, due to the increased attention that methamphetamine use has gained within our province here in Manitoba. And so in 2019 and 2020, uh, Dr. Sartier and I partnered with Manitoba Health in order to quantify how meth use has changed in Manitoba over the past several years and to gain a better understanding of um, the characteristics of people living in Manitoba who use methamphetamines. Uh, as Mariette mentioned, I, I do a lot of my research using uh, administrative data. And what we did was we looked into the whole population administrative data that we have here in Manitoba and found everyone who had a meth-related healthcare contact between the years of 2013 and 2018. And we looked at their patterns of healthcare use and as well as describing some of their characteristics. And this gave us a really nice, complete picture of the magnitude of, uh, that, of the impact that meth use is having on our healthcare system. What we found was that uh, between 2013 and 2018, which when we did the study, that was the latest data we had at the time, we found a 700% increase in the number of individuals who had a meth-related healthcare contact. When we looked at the sex ratio for uh, people who use meth, we found that it was a pretty even split, about 50-50 males to females. Something that we looked at was where people live in the city of Winnipeg, which is the largest urban center here in our province, and as well where they had contacts with the healthcare system, such as um, having a contact with Winnipeg Fire and Paramedics. And what we found was that at the start of our study in 2013, a large uh, proportion of those individuals were coming into contact in the downtown core and that scene in that dark area. But by 2018, it had really spread out across the entire city and represented both high and low income socioeconomic statuses. When we looked at the characteristics of individuals who uh, came into contact with the system for meth use, we found not surprising um, that they had a whole host of complex factors that they were facing. Things like um, experiencing poverty, um, living in areas with few employment opportunities, 
had experiences of trauma, um, had experiences with institutionalized and structural racism, and also had a history of mental health comorbidities. Uh, and in fact, when we looked at uh, the mental health profile of individuals with meth-related contacts, although about 20% of Manitobans uh, in our province uh, struggle with mental illness, 70% of those individuals who had a meth-related healthcare contact, before their first meth-related healthcare contact, they had received a diagnosis for another mental disorder. So really um, high complex needs uh, facing this population. And it really speaks to the need for a intersectoral um, approach to addressing uh, the methamphetamine uh, it, crisis that we're facing currently here in our province. And with that, I will um, hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you very, very much, Nathan um, and Christine. I'll hand over the mic to you. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the pharmacology of methamphetamine. Uh, so methamphetamine belongs to a group of drugs that act as a stimulant to our central nervous system. Um, and what it does is that it acts primarily on uh, dopamine in our reward system of the brain. So dopamine makes us feel really good. Um, there are various things that we like to do like eating and sex, um, which will elevate levels of dopamine to varying degrees in the brain. Um, but methamphetamine, there's a much larger release of dopamine that remain in the system for a longer period of time that's far greater than what normally would occur when we engage in the regular things that we like to do. So this is what causes that intense euphoria or that rush of intense energy and alertness. Uh, some people say that it's, it's just the best that they've ever felt. Um, just to compare, so uh, this uh, figure um, here combines data from a few papers that studied this. So you can see that food um, increases dopamine release um, by about 50 to 100 percent. Nicotine was found to increase the basal release of dopamine by about 200 percent and cocaine by 300 percent. But methamphetamine was found to increase dopamine by 1100 percent within an hour of use. So it can just take that one time for someone to want to take it again for the second time and the third time and so on. And it may never feel as good as that first time, which is what drives some people who, to want to use higher doses with each subsequent use and even change the route from smoking or snorting to injecting to try to get that same effect. Methamphetamine is also very long acting. Um, so cocaine, just to compare, is also a stimulant and it's broken down fairly quickly in our body. About 50% of cocaine is removed in our body in 30 minutes to an hour, whereas it takes 10 to 30 minutes for half of methamphetamine to be removed from the body. So that uh, results in a longer lasting stimulant effect, um, sometimes lasting days. Um, but those highs can also be followed by irritability, um, aggression, mood changes, weight loss, and psychosis. Um, so paranoia or hallucinations, sometimes people get a sensation of insects crawling under and over skin that results in skin picking. Um, regular methamphetamine use might follow a binge crash cycle where it's used for days followed by withdrawal. So within two to three days of that last dose, um, abruptly stopping methamphetamine can cause people to feel lethargic, profoundly depressed, and also have intense cravings. And this could happen, or this could last days to weeks, um, depending on how long methamphetamine was used for. Um, methamphetamine can affect other neurotransmitters like norepinephrine. Um, and overstimulation of norepinephrine can affect the heart, um, which can contribute to a higher risk of cardiac uh, arrhythmias or cardiac-related deaths. And um, we've certainly seen um, more cases of, of deaths in Manitoba where methamphetamine has been detected um, in the body. Overamping is a term that you might have heard uh, being used to describe stimulant overdose, uh, but methamphetamine is less predictable in terms of the dose and effect relationship. It's not quite like opioids where there's um, where the risk of overdose is directly related to the dose that's used. Um, sometimes overamping might happen regardless of how much or how little a person has used and may be more dependent on how long a person has been awake for or how worn down the body is from not eating or drinking enough water, um, or if there's a chance that um, there may have been other drugs that have been mixed in with its use. 
um, signs of someone who may have taken too much methamphetamine um, might include a person coming in and out of consciousness. Their muscles might be very rigid. Um, their heart is racing, sweating profusely. And they might um, also experience psychological distress like paranoia or, or hallucinations or be extremely agitated. Um, and that those psychological symptoms might uh, sometimes interfere with getting medical treatment. Um, I may just also just end with saying that there, there is no antidote for methamphetamine um, overuse. And it's not like opioids where there's naloxone to reverse the effects of, of overdose. Um, really high levels of methamphetamine doesn't have a naloxone equivalent, um, but certainly um, sometimes it's not always easy to know um, what uh, the person might be um, overdosing on. So it's not unsafe to give naloxone in those situations, but um, there's certainly not an antidote that can reverse those effects. Um, a lot of the management is, is through support and a lot of the management of methamphetamine uh, dependency is also through non-medication approaches. Um, but I might just end it there because I think I'm over time. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, now I would like uh, to invite uh, James to, um, to the panel. Well, thank you very much, Mariette. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here talking about uh, what I think is really a very important public health problem for us here in Manitoba and in Canada in general. I'd like to start just by really commending the work of uh, Maria Chartier and Nathan Nickel with producing this deliverable report and, and the team at Manitoba Centre for Health Policy. I mean, it, it really is a tremendous addition to the literature advancing our understanding of methamphetamine. So I really encourage everybody to take a look at that deliverable report. It's excellent. I'd also like to thank the University of Manitoba for drawing attention to, to this, this important issue. I'm coming at tonight's talk really from a clinical perspective. I've worked in emergency psychiatry for 20 years now. And uh, for the last seven years, since the opening of the Crisis Response Center in downtown Winnipeg, I, I've been the director there. And it's just fascinating to think back to, to that time around 2013, because we were really not seeing any meth whatsoever in Winnipeg. We all knew about meth. We'd heard about meth. You'd seen it in TVs and movies. And, but uh, we just weren't seeing it clinically. And then, and then it started, and then all of a sudden it really became a tidal wave. Uh, and we were seeing more and more people come in with these very, very sick presentations. And that's, I think, what has jumped out uh, to clinicians since the beginning of, of this uh, meth wave is really just how destabilizing this substance is, how different it is than other drugs of abuse, uh, how severe it is. And in particular, uh, its propensity to cause psychosis in individuals and a very difficult to manage psychosis. So you can see here this graph, which comes from the deliverable report. It looks at, you know, people who use methamphetamines in the uh, lighter blue bar there and then the rest of Manitobans. And you can see that after uh, people had their first contact for methamphetamine, uh, in Manitoba, you see the rates of mental disorders after that compared to the general population, uh, astronomical rates of depression and anxiety disorders, and uh, enormous rates of substance use disorders. And by that, we're looking at alcohol and other drugs of abuse. So, I mean, you know, moving towards half of people having a serious drug use disorder. But I draw your attention to the bar around psychotic disorders because, in general, psychotic disorders are not common. You know, they affect one to two percent of the population but amongst people who are using methamphetamine what this graph showed us is we were seeing rates of 15 16 percent in the year after they started using meth which is very alarming and uh and when you look at the literature uh, you see the same pattern which is um, methamphetamine causes psychosis in a far higher rate than other drugs up to one third of people that use it develop a psychotic condition the scariest thing for me as a clinician is the fact that in some people, this becomes a permanent condition even after they stop using methamphetamine. So it really has this toxic effect on the brain in some individuals. And what that tells me is there is no safe amount of methamphetamine, that this is not a drug you can experiment with. It is a dangerous substance, and we really need to draw attention to that. The other thing is uh, we've, we've heard a lot about the overdose deaths that happen with opiates, and, and that is a very real problem as well. We are starting to see more and more meth 
be a causative agent in those overdose deaths in Manitoba. And a couple of years ago, it had crept up already to being present in a quarter of overdose deaths. So people are using drugs together and this can be a very lethal combination. Now, we can talk a lot about how problematic meth is, uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that um, the people who use it are not simply their addiction. Uh, you know, this is a drug that affects very real people. It affects vulnerable people. And uh, we, we really need to think about how we get help to those individuals, the kinds of barriers uh, that they face in accessing care and how we can overcome that and get help to them. So one of the things we decided to do uh, down at Health Sciences Center, uh, I had a really keen medical student named Lachlan Wilson working with me a couple of summers ago. And uh, we said, you know what, let's get the people's perspective. People who come into hospital with methamphetamine use, uh, let's talk to them. Let's interview them and, and see what they describe about their pathway using the drug and getting care. And the results were really alarming. I mean, I really have to credit Lachlan for sitting down and, and interviewing numerous people who uh, who are struggling with meth use. And what we found is that um, that about 90% of them, 9 in 10, uh, voice a real need for services. 9 in 10 of them said they were looking for hospitalization or more information or counseling resources. But despite that high need, less than half of those people were getting any kind of treatment. And so why is there that treatment gap? And I, I think there's a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons that jumped out is that these people face tremendous stigma when trying to access care. And that stigma can be pervasive across sectors. We certainly see it in the healthcare system that, uh, that these people, when they walk in the door, can be stigmatized by healthcare providers. They can be stigmatized by the general public. And they even talked about being stigmatized by their family members. So I think we need to start recognizing these factors. Uh, we need to look at sort of a comprehensive care map for these individuals. How, not, not only you know, the right drugs to treat meth or the right counseling, but also how do we overcome these pervasive societal themes of stigmatization of, for meth and, and addictions in general. So it was uh, fascinating to see that, that work come out. You know, the last thing I'd say is I, I want to end with a message of hope, um, despite the fact that this is a very real and um, and significant problem facing us uh, in medicine and society. There is a lot of hope for individuals who are struggling with meth addiction, and we've seen uh, very important steps moving in the direction of treatment in recent years. Uh, big credit to the provincial government for. Uh, envisioning and opening and funding the RAM clinics. RAM stands for Rapid Access to Addictions Medicine. These are really innovative clinics where you can walk in the day of without an appointment, without a referral, and be seen by an addiction specialist. Those clinics are open Monday to Friday, every day in Winnipeg, and there's RAM clinics around the province. And, uh, and we've seen a lot of individuals come through and, uh, and get much needed care. And I also want to credit uh, the diverse agencies around Winnipeg, shelters, uh, detox facilities like Main Street Project, uh, AFM is providing uh, valuable service, and of course, the, uh, the healthcare sectors like the emergency department and the CRC. Uh, there, so there's a lot of help out there for people, and I, I want to end with that message of hope, both for individuals that are struggling as well as for families. There are routes we can go, and I think we've got some links to some resources uh, embedded in this talk. So uh, please access them if, if that is of need. Thank you very much, Mariette. Thank you very much, James. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for very interesting uh, talks. Um, so I guess um, what we're going, going to do now is uh, the fun part. We get to, well, it was all fun, so we get to uh, discuss this a little bit more. So thank you for the audience who has already started uh, sending in some questions. But just to remind others, uh, right at the bottom of the screen there, it says for questions, please use uh, slido.com. And there's the, uh, the code that you need to enter just to, um, to ask questions. So the first question is from Nicole. And uh, she's posing it to Dr. Nickel, uh, but you know, if anyone else wants to jump in. Uh, so um, Dr. Nickel, has there been any studies looking at 
the increase in meth use compared to opiate use stats with the start of the OET and the RAM clinics that uh, Dr. Bolton was talking about? That's a great question. We haven't uh, been able to look at that yet. We do, um, but I'll say that we've uh, received some funding from Health Canada um, that is allowing us to extend some of our analyses that we began within the meth project that I was sharing about. And we intend to be looking at uh, some different interventions and the impacts those are having on uh, contacts with the healthcare system for meth, looking at things like access to RAM clinics, as well as looking at things like um, uh, the, the mental health and addictions courts that we have here in the province and a couple other strategies. So we haven't done that yet here in the province, but uh, we do have funding to continue uh, some deeper dives. So thanks for that. I'm not sure, James, you want to jump in anecdotally. Uh, what, what are you seeing? Um, yeah, just that. I, I mean, I think we need to look at this more for sure. Uh, I think um, there, there's been a lot of efforts across uh, many areas and uh, and I think we're, we're starting to see gains. So uh, I, I'm a data guy and uh, so I'm going to follow Nathan on this one. And uh, I think that we, we definitely have set the stage that we need more studies of this to help guide things. So I'm looking forward to doing more of that work. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have a, a, a question from Jim. Uh, would you can, and I, I, so I, I think we will uh, ask Christine and James. He hasn't really, um, you know, directed it to anyone. But uh, would you consider olanzapine, uh, olanzapine? I'm not pronouncing it to be an antidote for methamphetamine toxicity. Um, uh, maybe Christine. Sure. Um, so, so olanzapine is is an antipsychotic, and um, it's uh, it helps target the psychosis symptoms like hallucination, delusion, um, by acting as a dopamine blocker. Uh, Dr. Bolden probably will have more experience about how effective it is for methamphetamine specific um, psychosis, um, uh, but it doesn't uh, reverse uh, any of of the nor of the cardiac effects that might be associated with methamphetamine as well. So um, it can actually have some risk too on cardiac um, effects, olanzapine does, and um, and may also lower the seizure threshold too. So there's you have to be a little bit cautious about using it or too much of it, but, um, but it does act as a dopamine blocker and can potentially help with, um, with the uh, psychosis symptoms and also is sedating as well. And I, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, the, this, the, uh, the issue with meth just exploded so quickly uh, clinically that we haven't had a chance to accumulate great uh, data from treatment studies the way we would normally do, you know, rigorous randomized controlled trials over years. We just haven't had that chance. Clinicians needed something now. And, uh, and, and so there, there is a theory behind it. Meth increases dopamine and olanzapine and other medications in its class block dopamine. Uh, so people started using it. And it certainly is, I would say, olanzapine clinically in Manitoba is our go-to medication for people who come in intoxicated on meth. And, uh, and, and so we, we use it liberally. And, and in some people, it works acutely to, to, to relieve that intoxication and uh, to relieve the psychosis. But we still need much more study to see um, you know, how this compares to other treatments sort of placebo. And what we really don't know is, you know, how long should we be using uh, olanzapine? Uh, so the, the correct dosage and the, the length of time, uh, should these people be on it regularly for a set amount of time after that? We're not, we're not really sure. So, the, you know, clinically we're using it a lot. It does appear to, to work in the short term, but we need more work. Hmm. Which, you know, Nathan, do, do you want to talk a little bit about uh some of the work you're, you're leading uh, in that respect? 
Yeah, so um, the Winnipeg Fire and Paramedic Service has had a, a strong interest in looking at outcomes related to olanzapine. And so we've partnered with uh, a researcher at the Winnipeg Fire and Paramedics and an emergency department physician to begin mapping out a study. In fact, we met earlier this week uh, to start looking at uh, the pre-hospital outcomes initially. So asking questions like uh, whether administering olanzapine reduces the risk that someone leaves against medical advice or leaves without being seen. Um, will it keep them uh, in the system to, to receive some of that treatment early on uh, while they're um, still in the emergency department? So like some of those questions are, um, we're, we're mapping out the analyses with our data to be able to answer some of that and contribute to the evidence there. Yeah, if I can just add, Mariette, as well, um, you know, I, I don't think we pump up our, our tires enough here in Manitoba, but really this uh, Winnipeg Fire and Paramedic uh, data that we have is state of the art, and it's it's so unique to be able to look at this here in Manitoba. We can't look at it in many other jurisdictions. Uh, and and I think I think our our WFPS were the first ones in Canada to have that approval to use olanzapine in the field, which is interesting. The only other thing I was going to add clinically is we actually see individuals who are using meth come to the crisis center or come to the emergency department asking for a lanzapine. Uh, because I, I think, you know, we, we often don't realize that that psychotic paranoid state is a very scary place to be. Uh, it's terrifying for these individuals and uh, they may have experienced relief with the lanzapine. So, so, in, in a way, it's not surprising that we do see people coming in asking to, to get it. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It's um, there's to look forward to and, uh, you know, and to learn more. There's clearly, um, you know, I, I was just, uh, when I was hearing Christine talk about there, there is no an antidote at this time and, you know, that olanzapine isn't an antidote, but it it's, it's the beginning of trying to find a way to uh, to alleviate the you know the effects uh, of uh, of meth use. So the the next question is um, uh, from Jim Sim. Uh, James, do you think your numbers of comorbidity? I think he's referring to the slide you showed would change if you did a, a community sur survey as opposed to uh, the, the uh, data that you used uh, from um, the health systems, um, the healthcare system? All right, well, I, I'm glad you said who the question came from because for people that don't know, Jim Sim is uh, he's, he's a, a former mentor of mine, well, still a mentor, I guess, but uh, he loves to call me out in these types of talks and, uh, and really, uh, you know, ask me the tough questions. So thank you, Jim. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a great question. It sort of gets at the strengths and the limitations of this data source that we have, which is this data is all constructed based on people who come to service. So who it's not capturing is the group of people who are in the community who may be using methamphetamine and not coming into care. We, and it's hard to know for sure how big that group is. So, so to Jim's question, what would it look like? Well, um, and I'm really going to sound like a psychiatrist here answering a question with a question, but, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you know, the people who are coming in for care, are probably a, we, we, we can estimate that they're probably a, a, a more severe group. There's some level of distress that's bringing them in. So their, their rates of those comorbidities might be higher. Uh, but then again, on the, on the other side, uh, if, if we were able to capture the full burden of comorbidity in the population, it might, it might very well be higher than what we're seeing here. So. So it, the, these numbers are high and they could be an underestimation. So I'm really hoping, Jim, that I answered your question and you're not gonna give me a hard time tomorrow. <laughs> does, anybody, does anybody want to add to that? Uh, Nathan, you've, you've used uh, this data quite a bit. I don't know if you have some opinions on that. And Christine, you started using them as well, so. 
uh, Dr. Bolton really reflected <laughs> the, my thought when I heard the question. So I have nothing more to add to that. I, I suspect that it might, it might be bigger. We're, 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 you know, I think we're, the, from from the the study that uh, Nathan described, we found that um, people who use meth, it it sounds like they're uh, you know a more vulnerable population. Not all, but um, maybe accessing they have more uh, barriers to accessing services. So I would suspect that the numbers might even be bigger than what we found. I mean, but, the, and the, the one of the points, Mariette, that you just made about accessing the system. The most of the individuals whom we identified with uh, meth-related healthcare contact were identified through the WFPS data. We looked in a variety of different systems, the hospital system, the emergency department system, the physician's services. Uh, and for those of you who might be watching from outside of Manitoba or outside Canada, uh, because we have uh, the way our, our healthcare system works, um, we have every single record, every single healthcare contact, we have access to that. We didn't find many people through those different systems. Most of the people we found were individuals who had a paramedic contact. Um, and so they're in extreme distress as, as Dr. Bolton was pointing out uh, related to their meth use. Um, so we, we really are getting uh, like a, a high need system, uh, our high need uh, group of individuals who are are by and large marginalized in many different ways. And just going back to the slide that I shared, we found that these people were living in areas of the of the city and of the province with high unemployment, low income, um, few job opportunities, a lot of factors that. Uh, place them in a marginalizing situation. Um, so, so just a really complex life story that they're coming into contact with the system around and you overlay on top of that methamphetamine use. And so it's, it's um, there's a lot happening. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for adding that. Um, we have a question uh, from Heather Watson. Uh, it's for Dr. Bolton, but I, I think um, uh, Dr. Leon might be able to answer some of this as well. Can you speak to the dysphoria during the first weeks, months, post-meth cessation? It doesn't seem to respond to antidepressants. Any strategies for symptom relief? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I, I think you're touching on a very important topic here. Again, one that we just don't know enough about, which is the whole withdrawal associated with methamphetamine. Uh, you know, we're, we're becoming quickly familiar with the intoxication of, of meth, but the withdrawal is an understudied phenomenon. Uh, we, we know certainly, like when you've exposed your neurotransmitters to that much dopamine, uh, these surges and especially repetitive use, when you take that away, there can be this this backlash. And and I I know I'm I'm speaking very um, uh, simply about this, but you, you know all of a sudden you you have this really like uh, uh, underwhelming supply of dopamine and pleasure drug in your brain. So it's not surprising that people are quite down and quite de depressed, and um, uh, and. I, I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. We, we know that we want to put distance between the person's last use uh, and, and where they are. And so increased distance, just like with a lot of other addictions, you see a gradual uh, normalizing of, of a person's emotional state over time. Uh, how long that takes with meth and is there any way to improve that, uh, I think remains a, a good question. But I, I sh certainly welcome any comments that uh, Dr. Leung might have as well. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think it's it's I agree with what you said. I think it's um really hard. I think it can feel after having um your system sort of flooded with dopamine, it, it, things could look very dull considering how how much um of a difference it feels when um someone might be exposed to methamphetamine immediately. So, um yeah, 6 months out, I think it, they would be very resistant um 
would be very much more difficult to treat um, with antidepressants, I think, um, further out. But certainly, I think there needs to be more data on, on that management. Thank you both. Um, I'd invite you, Nathan, but I think the, the clinician stuff is, is not no. quite a <laughs> I don't want I'm you to feel left out. I'm reminded by my spouse that I'm not a clinician quite frequently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, questions are just coming in. So um, Stephen Raho uh, has a question. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's directed to, uh, to James, but are there any particular strategies that would be useful when managing met a methamphetamine user who has become violent? Good question. Sa safety is is paramount uh, in this, and uh, that's certainly often kind of the backdrop or the front and center issue that brings people to care, uh, whether it's uh, police or or concerned family members. Uh, it, it's a very it's a very scary time for sure. So um, I I am a, a major proponent of safety and often uh, give the advice that uh, we need to err on the side of caution. So, uh, you know, people, uh, people, loved ones who, who have someone in their family or close to them using methamphetamine uh, can, you know, try to contain things or deal with things in their own home environment, um, which, which is great, except for the fact that a person, we, we know that some people when they're using meth do become quite scared, paranoid, aggressive, violent, and it can be very dangerous. So what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, ha have a, a low uh, threshold for seeking care and and uh, having the person brought into care. And that, that can be tricky. It's, it's not always easy. And, and sometimes they won't go uh, of their own will and you need to engage other services. But it's very, very important when it reaches that level. Um, the other thing is, and I'm not trying to um, just over dramatize uh, these situations with meth, but we do see them as being quite unpredictable. Uh, we have to remember that when somebody's psychotic, when they're detached from reality, they're not thinking or behaving the way we would. And, and as a result, we may think, oh, well, they're fine right now. This is not a dangerous situation, but things can turn quickly. And so if there is that worry at all, I, I would certainly get them to care as quickly as you can. Yeah, there's a, there's a good resource called um, Towards the Heart um, that's online that um, offers some information on, uh, like, if you encounter someone who might be experiencing, um, like, over, like, too much methamphetamine use, um, they provide some some tips on what you can do until help can be received, um, like keeping calm, encouraging hydration. Um, you know, don't giving anything by by mouth if they're unconscious or if a seizure is happening, just kind of move things around. So, um, and there's also mental health first aid training um, that's available now, um, a lot basic online. Um, so, um, that's something that could be considered if, yeah, if that's of interest to you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you both. And I, I guess that's where the interest again with olanzapine has come in. Right? It's it's something that that might help a little bit uh in the meantime while while the, the effect of the meth is is uh is leaving um okay we have a question from Noor, uh breck um i hope i pronounced that properly so any studies to see how marijuana legislation influences or worsens meth addictions is there any connection between the two, the legislation and uh, meth addiction? And are there any upcoming studies to investigate uh, COVID-19's pandemic and the meth crisis? So maybe we can break that into two. Uh, I, you know, I think I'll direct that to Nathan. You've been unusually quiet. So uh, I will ask you about uh, what you think. Is there a connection between marijuana legislation and uh, meth addiction? So I'm not aware of studies that have drawn a, a link between legalizing non-medical uh, cannabis use here in Canada and meth addiction or, or even meth use. Um, I haven't seen that overlap investigated. I know that uh, 
Dr. Balneves from the School of Nursing and Dr. Kelly from uh, CHI and Pediatrics are both studying uh, cannabis use. Uh, within the context of legalizing non-medical cannabis. So they might have more information about that. Um, and the second question was, I'm sorry. It... Um, so, well, maybe let's, let's deal okay. with this question after. So they're, they're, they're quite separate, I think. Dr. Leong, I, are you, you're, I, I feel like you're also working with Dr. Kelly on her cannabis project, but I could be mistaken about that. Uh, not on that one in particular. Okay. There's okay. a different one that I am, yeah. <laughs> Do do either James or Christine have a, a you know a, are aware of any of uh, the link between that the legislation and addictions? I I don't, but I I do have a graduate student that's starting soon that's going to be looking at the information from the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, and I'm I'm hoping we're able to kind of gather some information and and learn a little bit more. So it, yeah, it might be something that's up and coming hopefully. Great. Okay. All right, so let's go to the second one. Um, any upcoming studies to investigate the COVID-19 pandemic and the meth crisis? And maybe maybe I'll ask uh, James to, to take a jab at that one. Yeah, I, I, I thought these were both really good questions. Um, I So to try to answer it in the most direct way possible, I'm not aware personally of any studies, but I think um, I, I think you're, you're definitely hitting a, a very good point with that question. Um, Certainly, uh, some of the survey of the Canadian population through the initial stages of the uh, pandemic, the Canadian Center for Substance Abuse uh, looked at a sort of a broad national survey of people's uh, alcohol and substance use in the pandemic. And they showed that, you know, amongst people that drink alcohol and use cannabis, their use went up in the pandemic. Probably not surprising for a variety of reasons. Distress, uh, boredom. Uh, you know, uh, there's there's a variety of reasons why substance would go up, and and I think it probably has continued as as the pandemic has really dragged on. So how that relates to meth is a good question. Um, you know, w whether people are using it for those same reasons or for other reasons, but uh, I think it would certainly be something that uh, that we want to look at over the past year. What what's happened to meth use during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Nathan, do you have uh, any ideas on that? Or well, the the study you were referencing earlier, Mariette, that um, actually everyone on my screen here is is going to be working with us on the Health Canada funding. We um, we recently got approvals to update our cohort of individuals here in the province with health related with healthcare contacts um, related to meth going up until 2021. So we will be able to like, extend our time trend analyses to see whether or not we can identify an inflection point at the start of the pandemic and whether how the, the trend over time might or might not have changed uh, within the context of COVID. So uh, we're, we got the approvals last week. So it, there's a, all of that privacy process to make sure we're doing things in a good way. Um, but now that we have those, that'll be one of our early next steps. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is, uh, is harm reduction a reasonable strategy with meth or is it just too dangerous? Is harm reduction a viable option? What would it, what, what would it look like in general terms? Uh, who feels like jumping into that one? I guess I'm looking at Christine or James. Well, like I think there are some benefits. I think, um, I mean, harm reduction strategy. I think if um, similar to um, with other substances, like if there's any sort of way that can help connect people to to receive help right away, um, I think that that would be very helpful, I guess, in that in those situations, if there's someone there that's able to kind of monitor and help um, patients. Um, but I don't know if there's a lot of data to look at methamphetamine use specifically. But, um, but yeah, I think just connecting people um, to people that can help them if they're needed. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I would just add, um, 
Uh, you know, it's it's outside of my area for sure, but I think there's a, a range of harm reduction techniques. And, uh, and you know, whereas uh, a long time ago, sort of a model for addictions treatment was really a black and white abstinence kind of model. And, uh, and certainly you're seeing a, a lot more uh, harm reduction strategies with substances like alcohol, cannabis, uh, things like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I was just talking about how dangerous methamphetamine is, and, and I'm, I'm probably biased with what I see clinically, that it just does seem so psychologically destabilizing to people that it's hard to imagine a safe amount. On the other side, when you look at harm reduction strategies, not just amounts, but things like safe injection sites and, uh, uh, you know, needles and things like that. Uh, I mean, we, we certainly... Again, when we were uh, seeing the meth uh, evolution in Winnipeg, you saw people initially sort of um, smoking it or snorting it, and then this transition to IV use. Uh, and it's been, uh, I was talking to some addictions colleagues, which said that actually meth has one of the quickest transitions from uh, smoking to IV use, which is quite dangerous. So that ushers in the whole uh, topic of safe injection sites and uh and just reducing disease transmission, um, uh, reducing early fatalities around uh, like the initial use period, you know, where people can be monitored a little bit. So um, I feel like I'm going to say this a lot tonight, but I think we just need more studies to to examine this. Is, is that a viable option for math? I, I don't think we really know at this point. It probably is related, Christine, to what you were saying. It's just so highly addictive. Like you, you take it once and it, you know, which explains a little bit that high transition from snorting and smoking to IV use. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get to my own questions. There's so many questions coming in. This is great. <laughs> so uh, here's a question from um, Srina Madur. Uh, starts off by saying, thanks for your wonderful presentations. Meth use seems to be a concoction of several factors, social, economical, structural, etc. Is there a scope for inclusion of lived experience groups in developing interventions, including research? Um, Nathan, I see you nodding. Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. That's uh, something that is actually recommended by the Canadian Center for Substance Use and Addictions, like uh, bringing people together with lived experiences to talk about strategies, not just from uh, the prevention standpoint, I mean, from the treatment standpoint, but also from the prevention standpoint. So uh, what are the structures and systems that need to be put into place that will um, lower the uh, first time use, for example, and, and people with lived experience, uh, whether it's current or historic and people who love, the, love those uh, who use meth have valuable insights to share on in intervention strategies. And the question mentioned research, they have important insights on what research questions are pressing for that community and how, what's the best way, like how do we do this research in a good way? How do we do this research from a destigmatizing, um, person-centric approach so that uh, we move away from some of the rhetoric and language that results in blaming and um, go from a more a healing perspective? James, Christine, would you like to add to that? Okay. That was a great answer, Nathan. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I, I'd add to that. Just to say that, uh, you, you know, all, all of us do uh, on, on this panel do a lot of research and just more and more, almost universally now, we're just involving people with lived experience in these studies. The, the learnings are tremendous. Um, and uh, so not only does it inform the research, but then just makes the takeaways, the results so much more meaningful. Uh, so much more likely to make a difference on the ground, which uh, which is important. Yeah, I, I agree too. I've I've involved patients in in some of my other studies, and it's it's so helpful to understand what their barriers are, um, and um, 
and it really helps direct um, our research approach for sure. So I think it could be valuable in this area. And I'm hoping that um, when I have my grad students start uh, this spring, um, that uh, we'll be recruiting uh, some uh, people with lived experiences for that project as well. That sounds like a great idea. Um, a question from Gail. Uh, we, um, let's say, how do we optimize care pathways, especially given the stigma that we've just been talking about? Um, so how might we optimize care pathways for meth users considering interprofessional primary care, RAM, as well as post-treatment support? So the question is, I, I think for James about optimizing care pathways for meth users. Yeah, and, and Mariette, if I can just get you to sort of repeat the part about. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will repeat it. How might we optimize care pathways in brackets, especially given the stigma for meth users, considering interprofessional primary care as well as post-treatment support? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Really makes you think. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, you know, efforts to destigmatize at, at the public level um, mm -hmm. and to improve access to care, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, and, and I think steps have been taking, taken in that, in that direction. Again, with these sort of easier to access RAM clinics that have opened. Mm -hmm. um, it, although it may not be ideal, care through emergency and, and crisis centers are, are also, it's a key portal. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but meth has really changed uh, the structure of how we've provided this care. Uh, again, we haven't talked about it on, on this call, but the intoxication phase can be quite prolonged. Mm -hmm. uh, often people use and they are, are in an intoxicated uh, and sometimes psychotic state for several days. And uh, so, so that kind of early management becomes difficult. Um, just with our existing care structures, many of those people become hospitalized, uh, often on psychiatric wards. And then, and then the challenge is the drug wears off and often the, the care pathway kind of gets fractured at that point where maybe they want to leave hospital uh, or maybe they're deemed well enough to, to leave. And then you've got r real challenges with follow-up because we haven't developed those models yet mm. or what that should look like. And like, you know, uh, Christine was talking about how addictive meth is, that craving when you, when you come down, um, how, do you, how do you intervene in that key juncture to make sure the person doesn't go back out to use? Um, it, it, it's, it's really made us rethink this, this whole piece. So, uh, and I, so, you know, and I think the question really asked about follow-up. So I think we need, we need to somehow um, really integrate uh, addictions care um, much more closely with, with that upfront uh, state of intense intoxication. Like how do we get people then linked with care? You know, again, I think there's been efforts with that, with um, expanding um, detox beds at uh, Main Street Project, for example, and uh, better networking within the addictions framework. But the, um, the individual, I'm sorry, I forgot their name who asked the question, but uh, they, they talked about this sort of interprofessional uh, primary care angle, and that's absolutely key. Uh, so how do we weave in that addictions care uh, at the primary care level before we've gotten to the point of moving into acute or tertiary care? Uh, I think uh, the, these are really the questions. I mean, we, we need a lot of we need a lot of broad societal pieces and then really refining our care pathways. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that was a tough question because that's a, a question that it's it's a whole plan and um, it sounds like it's it's in development. And clearly, um, I think the, the the research that we're talking about and including people with lived experiences will certainly help with developing those pathways, those care pathways. So this is a question from uh, Christina Barton. Um, has there been consideration to seeking data from service providers funded through provincial programs such as PASS, CLDS, CFS, 
And how can service providers support individuals using meth when we're still researching its impact? Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe that's for you, Nathan. I might repeat it, it's a long question. Um, and Christine, maybe you can think about this too. Uh, or all of you, has there been consideration to seeking data from service providers through provincial programs such as PASS, CLDS, CFS, and how can service providers best support individuals using meth when we're still researching its impact? So that, yeah, that is a great question. Um, we so at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, uh, where we have access to these data, we actually have quite a bit of data from different programs uh, outside of the healthcare system as well, uh, including CFS. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that well, there's two challenges. One challenge is that. Uh, service provider data aren't always collected with, are not collected with the intent of doing research on them. Um, so, so there's challenges there. The second is that a lot of these data outside of the healthcare system are unstructured, meaning they're free text, they're, they're notes that are being taken during an interaction. It's not a yes, no code, like an ICD code. And the challenge with the free text part of it is, is twofold. One, there's a lot of information within that free text that needs to be mined through so that you can identify whether meth use is being uh, referenced in the, uh, by the service provider. The second piece is actually more challenging, uh, which is privacy. So we, we have a lot of information at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, and all of that information is de-identified so that we protect people's privacy. When you go to free text information, you get people's names and you have people's birth dates, and it becomes really challenging at, uh, to scrub identifiers out of free text information. And so there's, there's the twofold issue of the data mining that needs to occur to pick out meth use from uh, information provided by service providers. And the second is being able to scrub out all of the identifiers so that we can use that information in a good, safe, privacy protected way. Um, so right mm -hmm. now there's people, not myself, I don't have this, uh, I don't have money to do this, but there's other individuals at the Center for Health Policy, like uh, Dr. Katz, Dr. Licks, uh, Dr. Wall Wheeler, who are really diving into how can we use the free text information that we get from these other programs in the province and really harness it to do some meaningful research like you're referencing with your question. So there is a desire, we are starting it and it's going to be a lot of work to make sure that we are protecting uh, individuals' privacy. Thank you very much. I guess the second part of the question was how can service providers best support individuals mm. So maybe that's more for, for James and Christine. So I guess, you know, people working within CFS or people working, um, you know, in different uh, provincial programs, you know, how can they as a service provider uh, best support uh, people using meth? Christine, I don't know if, if you want to jump in. Or... Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough because there's such limited information. Like, I, like I'm even thinking just from like a, a pharmacist standpoint too. Like, I, I think we could use a lot of training. Um, pharmacists are are often um, are often providing care to patients that are struggling with methamphetamine use. And um, I mean, I've I certainly would encourage. Um, looking into the mental health first aid training is just a start, but I know that's not, it's not going to answer all, all of your questions and how to manage it. But I mean, um, yeah, so it's, it's tough. I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. It, it is tough. I, and I, I would only add that um, 
you, you know, you're, you're really kind of uh, operating as a service provider. I think what the question is partially getting at is, you, you know, you can be that point of contact for this person, right? Even though you may not be working in that uh, environment per se, um, anybody working in care or other agencies comes in contact with people who are using that. So I think there's a key role of navigation. And, and what, what's important with that is just awareness of resources. And, and I think that's one, one of the areas that's, that's building rapidly in the province. And, and we've got some of these resources embedded here, we've got links for the AFM page uh, and for RAM. But, um, you know, just to be kind of aware of what meth addiction is like and where can you direct somebody so they can at least take those first steps to get care. Uh, and I think um, so that navigation role is key, even if you're not going to treat it directly. Mm. I, I'm just wondering too. Uh, I, I worked in in psychiatry as as a nurse quite a while ago, and and I remember always wondering how do you prevent people from even getting there in the first place. So I, I you know, I, can we speak to that a little bit? It, it, does anybody on this panel have ideas on how? It, it sounds like when you start using meth. Uh, it's it's so addictive and it, it it's so difficult to um, you know it, it does such harm to your body and your mind. Do do we have any ideas on on how we can work maybe upstream? And I'm wondering if that's uh, where the service providers can help, where CFS workers, where you know people working in different um, different parts of uh, the system. I mean, there's uh, been some really fascinating research, uh, qualitative research as well as quantitative research, looking at people with lived experience and um, those who end up using methamphetamines. And some of the stories, particularly coming out of the qualitative research, really points to the need to address the underlying social determinants of, of health. So people in qualitative studies talking about how um, they don't have money for food for the weekend. And so because of unemployment or because of underemployment or low income or what have you. And as uh, Dr. Leong pointed out, uh, the euphoria from methamphetamine use can last a long time, 48 hours. And so you can get through a weekend without having to eat. Um, for the cost of a cup of coffee. Uh, so it, it's uh, a way to meet the immediate physical needs that present themselves due to unmet uh, socioeconomic needs, um, unmet education needs. Um, it also, the literature also points to the fact, as I mentioned earlier, people with uh, a history of meth use also had a history of, of trauma, of intergenerational trauma, of, of sexual trauma in childhood. So really thinking about what are those factors that lead individuals to use meth, we see it's uh, a lot of the same factors that lead to many other poor health outcomes of, of underemployment, low employment, low income, experiencing systemic racism that um, results in some populations being less likely to, to have a living wage when compared with other populations. So I, I would point to those um, social factors. And here in Canada, um, we can't talk about this without pointing to the colonial history and the ongoing uh, impacts of the colonial project that are happening today uh, and as as dealing as a determinant of methamphetamine use in our province. So I don't think we can ignore our own history and our own present with with that either. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. <laughs> you just keep coming in. You're doing a fantastic job because these these are not easy, and uh, I, I find this panel is doing a, a really good job answering them um and there's there's not always answers though and um so we'll just keep asking though so nicole uh Vosters asks does anyone have any good patient-centered resources 
sites, readings, etc., that explains in a more simplistic way at a patient education level the effects of meth on the brain. So, Christine, I guess everything that you said, but it, and I thought you explained it quite well, but maybe you know, um, it, more in lay language. Yeah, uh, I think, well, Towards the Heart has some good resources there. I, I feel like that's, a, that's one of the websites I can think of that might be, uh, might provide some information. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, would, I would think that, uh, you know, the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba website also would have some very um, uh, kind of uh, user-friendly um, literature and, and materials on, on learning about math, for sure. Right. Okay. Um, oh, another question from Christina Barton. Uh, as a follow-up, when individuals using meth present with potential psychosis, we engage services, request assessments. However, there seems to be a gap for treatment of substance use psychosis and people are released. What then do we do? Um, I might have to read that again. Eh? Um, and I think that might be a question for you, James, not to put you on the spot, but I'll read it again because I might not have put the commas at the right place. As a follow-up, when individuals using meth present with potential psychosis, we engage services, we request assessments. However, there seems to be a gap for treatment of substance-induced psychosis and when people are released, what do we, what then do we do? I, I, yeah. I think you mentioned that as a, as a real problem. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, at least in my experience, again, working in the emergency department and uh, the crisis center, there's very active treatment of the psychosis when, when individuals present uh, with mass psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so liberal treatment uh, with antipsychotics and in a matter of time, whether it's, you know, within hours or a few days, they can usually get things under control. But I think that's a good point is, so what, what is the treatment of choice for this meth-induced psychosis going forward? Should the person, once they're not psychotic anymore, remain on an antipsychotic? Uh, and again, we don't, we don't have good answers. And we struggle with, I think, the follow-up of these individuals to, to say, okay, what's happening to them over time? And mm -hmm. more of that, if we have the resources to go with a more of an assertive outreach follow-up model, I think would be helpful. Uh, and, and just more longitudinal data to say, you know, again, what, what, what happens to these people after that first uh, or first couple of meth psychosis episodes? How quickly do they relapse to psychosis? Is there a preventative measure for medications? Uh, because... Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to know how how long you should treat somebody with an antipsychotic. Mm. Yeah, there, there is, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in the toolbox of, of psychiatrists or, or all physicians, there's also longer acting injectable antipsychotics, which, and, and there is clear evidence. And, and I'm looking at Christine because uh, one of the graduate students working with us has done remarkable work with these, looking at the, uh, the powerful benefit of long-acting injectable antipsychotics. There's clear evidence in schizophrenia that that long-acting injectables uh, uh, are excellent. Uh, you know, provide mm -hmm. excellent benefit in reducing negative outcomes and and getting long-term psychosis under control. Mm -hmm. Is there a role for those in a substance-induced psychosis? I think that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nathan, I know that um, with some of the studies that um, that you're beginning, there might be that potential to to look at the cohort of um, people who use meth and maybe look at their trajectories over time. And we might be able to to somehow answer some of those questions, though I'm not sure if we can fully understand the factors that uh, influence that trajectory, but no, but we can begin to paint an initial picture of those trajectories at the very least within the administrative data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as you as you mentioned, uh, James, that just uh, you know, to 
get those extra resources to to do the follow up. Because mm -hmm. it's pretty clear, given what Christine has said, that it's so highly addictive. There's a good. There's going to be a, a next uh, dose. Um, so a question, another question. Uh, most meth users gain access to harm reduction supplies through some community-based organizations without any connection with healthcare system. Are there any strategies to capture and connect these vulnerable populations into care? Yeah, so um, I'll jump in, but uh, Dr. Bolton or Dr. Leong might have other, other thoughts. Um, I know that a local clinic here in Winnipeg, clinic with a K, and Nine Circles have some programs where they're reaching out into the community uh, mm -hmm. to uh, I'd connect with um, individuals experiencing houselessness uh, who are also uh, uh, using meth to connect them in with services. So there, there's some really, really innovative work that is happening right now around meth use uh, from different community-based organizations to address that very gap. I believe, I, I'm not entirely sure whether or not First Nations Health and Social Secretariat also is, is part of that effort, uh, but many of these projects are also funded by Health Canada as part of a, a, the response to the growing meth use that we're identifying here in, in the province of Manitoba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that would be interesting to kind of connect with with those um, services. Um, if, yeah, if there's a way to connect um, some of that um, information so that so that we could actually use it um, for research too, that would be great. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and I imagine the community-based organizations might be able to offer something that the health system, the healthcare system sometimes struggles with, like the, the cultural components um, yeah. that um, the people's people need. Um, okay, does anybody want to add anything to that or? So Kim Taves uh, asks, have you linked any data, stimulant medication prescriptions during childhood to meth use as an adult. Oh, oh I we, never thought about that. As, yeah. How about an invitation to join the research team? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kim, you're getting an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, like amphetamines, like uh, prescription amphetamines used to treat ADHD or, or narcolepsy. I think, I mean, they're similar in structure to, to methamphetamine, but that slight difference can make its effects so so different like methamphetamine just has so much more of a powerful release of, of dopamine than than the other amphetamines so so they're quite different from i guess effect wise i think um even though the structure is the same but yeah we don't really know if if there's any sort of link nothing i don't i don't know of any data that would suggest that but hmm. All right. Um, so, oh, another question: uh, in, Is aggression or even psychosis in meth users associated with associated more with intoxication or withdrawal? My, my, I mean, I'll take a shot at answering this first. Again, my my uh, experience with this is biased because I primarily. Uh, um, seeing the intoxication phenomena. Uh, that said, we, we do see a lot of people who come in for care who have used sort of four to, four to seven days prior to coming in, um, and then they have slightly different presentations. But certainly what we're seeing is that aggression and violence and unpredictability is associated with the intoxication stage. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's when things are most difficult. Um, when you're when you're seeing clinically somebody withdrawing from meth, uh, they they can be irritable and and often depressed. You know, we we talked about like sort of there's no more dopamine to be had, uh, but they're also very sleepy uh, and hungry. Uh, so you'll you'll have people who can sleep for 24 hours uh, and and eat huge amounts because they've gone so long without sleep and without eating. Uh, it kind of Nathan was mentioning that before. So. 
Um, so anyways, in my experience, uh, working clinically, the, the, the risk of violence is really with the intoxication phase. Does that make sense, Christine? From uh... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kim Bailey asks, how effective are the RAM clinics in treating addiction? Is this being studied? Maybe just... Yeah, it's definitely being studied, uh, for sure. Um, our, our current era is one of evaluation. So when these, when these uh, programs are rolled out, uh, the evaluation uh, demand on them is built right in. So the, the RAM clinics are a new initiative. Uh, they're being closely evaluated and monitored. And uh, all the data that I've seen in the early words that I've heard is that uh, they are very effective. Um, and and that, that's what our experience has been clinically on the ground. Um, you know, it was, it was really kind of a night and day phenomenon. You, the, I, I like to think, you know, try to put myself in, in the mindset of what it's like to struggle uh, when you're deep into an addiction. Mm -hmm. And just the day-to-day -day, uh, can become years. You know, walking into an emergency department and somebody saying, okay, I want you to go connect with, with an addiction service that's got an intake three weeks from now. Uh, you know, and, and Nathan was talking about this, the social determinants of health. When you've got no place to go and no food to eat and, and you're scared, uh, three weeks is a very, very long time, and it's hard to make it there. And what RAM uh, allowed to happen was you can get care the next day. You can get care that day. Uh, so, so there's no question the access has improved tremendously. But um, just, you know, uh, seeing, seeing the people come in, getting to see an addictions uh, specialist, getting to connect with... Uh, with an AFM counselor or uh, somebody who can navigate them through the system, the the results are very good, and uh, and these these things have certainly made a big impact. That's so nice to hear. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, Bailey has another question. Oh, uh, did, did anybody want to say something? No. Oh, I'm hearing voices. Oh, sorry. Um, about. So Kim Bailey asks, reharm reduction and meth use. Manitoba does not distribute meth pipes. This may increase needle use harms. This may, um, oh, this may increase ne uh, needle use harms for people who use meth. So again, we're we're back to talking about uh, harm reduction strategies. And it, what do you think about uh, distributing meth pipes? Would that um, be a good harm reduction uh, strategy in, in your opinion? Have you seen any studies looking at that? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll again, I'll take a shot at answering this, but again, welcome any comments from anybody. Um, so th this is the, the beauty of the, uh, the online era we live in right now. So I, I made all those comments about my mentor and those tough questions that he asked me. And, and since that time, he has actually texted me during this event and said, uh, I don't want to be rude, but I've got some answers that might help you out here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, again, uh, big, big, big thanks to, to Jim Sim here. But, um, uh, you know, uh, what he was saying, he, he knows a lot about these things. What he was saying that, uh, uh, if it's okay that I'm quoting you, Jim, but in BC, um, where we know that some, some of the programs they roll out in BC are really cutting edge with this. Okay. And, uh, and it looks like they are... Um, rolling out some guidelines around harm reduction with methamphetamine. So looking at things like actually prescribing uh, methylphenidate or amphetamines uh, as a harm reduction technique uh, so that people are getting a, a clean, unadulterated supply. Uh, so, you know, and Dr. Leo was saying, methylphenidate or amphetamines used to treat ADHD are nowhere as potent as methamphetamine is. But, um, but if you're looking to reduce the need to go out on the street and buy uh, a tainted supply and all the dangers that come with that. Maybe there is something to that. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what, what that shows. And, and also um, he was talking about, you know, the, the needs for clean needle supplies, uh, safe injection sites. And, and I don't know the specifics of that, but I think um, that, that uh, pipes can fall into that as well. 
uh, you know, and, and maybe that's been looked at with, with uh, uh, crack cocaine and things like that. But um, certainly I, I think the theme is, is providing a safe, less harmful supply that doesn't make a person go out and, and get involved in dangerous behaviors that have other mm -hmm. health effects as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, James and Jim. Uh, that's He's our honorary panel member. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, well, I'm, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, it, there's five minutes left. Uh, Heather Watson has is providing maybe a summary question. And so um, maybe in summary, the panel could address the value of interprofessionalism. How can we build more bridges to create more research opportunities? And uh, maybe maybe I'll start with Nathan on uh, on that question. How can we build more bridges for more research opportunities? Um, so I, I, I think Manitoba is a really special and unique place where there's quite a bit of relationship that exists between si typically siloed researchers and typically siloed government departments. So we've, uh, in addition to the work that we've mentioned here, there's a lot of relation, and why I know a little bit about the CFS data and why I know a little bit about the justice data is there's been work over the past 10 years to build relationships from in the research space between health, justice, education, uh, social services uh, that uh, different uh, researchers at the Center for Health Policy, such as Dr. Sartier, uh, Dr. Brownell, have been uh, really taking leadership on. So I think one of the strategies we found has been helpful is bringing folks together from different organizations, government departments, departments at the university to talk about what are some of the pressing needs and then designing studies together. So we have a partnership right now called Spectrum that is aimed at addressing that, Heather, where we're bringing together folks from law, so, um, sociology, CFS, education, uh, different um, community-based organizations to identify what are some of the pressing needs for research and what are some of the pressing needs for interventions that can improve the health and well-being of Manitobans. So we've started that work over the past couple of years, and I think meth use is certainly an area that is is ripe for for future work uh, with this partnership. Hmm. Christine, I'm wondering if you could add. Um, you know, it sounds like you're very good at working with with other. Professions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I definitely value just working with a team that have bring in just such diverse perspectives. And yeah, I, I'm all for making those bridges. It's um, yeah, and I, I, I like to hear what uh, Nathan had talked about. It's nice, it's encouraging to hear that there are efforts being made um, to um, encourage those bridges for sure. Um, yeah, I think I've I've lucked out that I've sort of interact, interacted with uh, the team that I've worked with, with Dr. Bolton and Dr. Nickel and, and um, yeah, and, and Dr. Kelly as well. So yeah, it's, um, I certainly would encourage that because I feel like it just makes um, the project that more, that much more richer. Thank you. And James, any, anything you'd like to add to that about working interprofessionally? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I just echo the comments here. It's um, it's been so wonderful to work with this group to have the opportunity to 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 really bring together all these uh, different areas of expertise uh, in public health and epidemiology and pharmacy and medicine and uh, and and you know again the, the engaging partners like uh, Winnipeg Fire and Paramedic Service. Um, you know, it's, it's so valuable. So it it's great, and and I am just so glad that this deliverable report happened. I mean, to see like what is really a current major health problem and, and to be able to do um, groundbreaking research in it in real time, uh, you know, not having to wait 20 years uh, to get these much needed answers. It's, um, it's just such a fabulous environment. We're very lucky here in Manitoba to have this. And uh, so, I mean, I, I, again, I look forward to these partnerships 
moving forward and, and hopefully we can continue to make a dent in these uh, issues. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not sure if they'll cut us off in 30 seconds. I wonder if it's, but uh, so <laughs> close. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for the fantastic answers and thank you to our audience for all the questions. Um, I didn't have to use a single one of the ones I had thought of. Uh, I'd like to, to thank you very much. Um, I found it informative, interesting. I got lots out of it. Um, and I encourage you, all, all of us on the panel and everyone uh, out, um, out there, uh, to uh, tune in again on March 15th. There's the next Café Scientifique during Brain Awareness Week. Uh, it's called uh, Research in Motion, the Latest Advances in Parkinson's Disease. <laughs>